When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. In our time this morning, I'm going to attempt to present to you an understanding on what the scriptures mean by the term Israel. Now, I'm sure you're aware there is a great disagreement within churchianity as to who Israel is. Does it refer to the nation Israel or the church of Yeshua? How you answer that question I think is very important. Because if you're going to understand the Bible and if you're going to understand its promises, you have to understand who Israel is. And I also believe that there's a connection between the church's view of Israel and terrorism. And I really think if the church got its act together on this, it could make a difference politically. I think because of dispensationalism, because of Christian Zionism, most Christians believe that we have a biblical mandate to stand behind and protect Israel no matter what they do. And this causes the Arabs to hate us. I believe that the true Israel is the Israel of faith, not of birth. Israel is spiritual, not natural. And this view has been called replacement theology. It is said that the church replaced Israel. But a much better term would be fulfillment theology. See, the promises of God made to Old Covenant Israel are being fulfilled in the church of Yeshua, which is the true Israel. And it is covenant, not race, that has always been the defining mark of the true Israel of God. Now, this view of fulfillment theology presents a major problem for the school of theology called dispensationalism. I would guess that most of you probably have been schooled in dispensationalism. How many of you were raised taught dispensationalism? Okay, that is most of you. <clears throat> I was. I taught dispensationalism, and I got to say, when I did, it was confusing to me. I taught the party line, but I was like, how did they get that scripture to say that? Dispensationalism is the school of theology came into being about in the 19th century, about 170 years ago. So as a theology, it's relatively new. And of all the things that dispensationalism teaches, the, the fundamental teaching of the system is there, there's a distinction between Israel and the church. And according to dispensationalism, God has two differing peoples, who each respectively have different covenant promises, different destinies, different purposes. Membership in Israel is by natural birth. What enters the church? By supernatural birth. Dispensationalists view Israel and the church as having two distinct eternal destinies. Israel will receive an eternal earthly kingdom. The church, an eternal heavenly kingdom. Now, in recent years, dispensationalism has been making some modifications. They're seeing the error of their ways, and they're making some changes. But irrespective of anything else that may be found in the system, if one rejects the Israel church distinction, one ceases to be a dispensationalist. Darby has written, the Jewish nation is never to enter the church. <laughs> These same scholars who teach this kind of stuff, they view Pentecost as the birth of the church. Now, who entered the church at Pentecost? It was the church was all Jewish for at least 10 years. It was just all Jewish. Ryrie he considered this the most important dispensational distinction and approves the statement, the basic premise of dispensationalism is the two purposes of God expressed in the formation of two peoples who maintain their distinction throughout eternity. Now, I think I can dismantle dispensationalism in about 60 seconds. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. What is promised here? A new covenant. Right? Who is it promised to? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. Anybody here disagree with that so far? You've got a problem if you disagree with that so far, okay? Because I haven't said anything. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. Well, then let me ask you this. What covenant is the church under? 
I mean, writing to the church at Corinth, notice how Paul compares the two covenants. He says, who also made us, the apostles, adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not a letter, that's the old covenant, but of the spirit, that's a new covenant. For the letter, the old covenant kills, but the spirit, the new covenant, gives life. See, the new covenant is particularly problematic for dispensationalism because Jeremiah 31 is undeniably addressed to Israel. The new covenant is at the very heart of the gospel, yet if the church is fulfilling the promise given to Israel in the new covenant, dispensationalism is dead. Now, I believe the Bible teaches the essential continuity of Israel and the church. The elect of all ages are seen as one people, true Israel, with one Savior and one destiny. Now, I want to expand this morning on the idea of the church being true Israel using typology. I think this is one of the most fascinating areas of biblical study is typology. And it's an area you have to be careful because some people make everything. Every peg in the tabernacle is a type, you know, and they try to go beyond. And I think you have to be careful. But scriptural types are, are very important. And what exactly do we mean by a type? Well, theologically speaking, a type may be defined as a figure or ensample of something future and more or less prophetic called the anti-type. Wick Brumall has a concise statement, I think, that is helpful. He says, a type is a shadow cast on the pages of Old Testament history by a truth whose full embodiment or anti-type is found in the New Testament revelation. Now, there are several words used in the Greek New Testament to denote what we have just defined as a type. First, there is the term tupos, uh, basically our English word type. Paul uses this in Romans 5.14 where he declares that Adam is a type, a tupos, of him who is to come, referring to Christ. Secondly, there is the word skia, which is rendered shadow. We see that in Colossians 2.16. Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or respect to a festival or new moon or Sabbath day. What is Paul referring to here by these terms? The old covenant law, the Mosaic law. Now watch what he says in the next verse. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. What is Paul referring to here? It's a Mosaic covenant. He says it's a shadow. And to come here is from the Greek word mellow. It means about to come. So at the time of Paul's writing Colossians, the Mosaic system was about to become a shadow. Now those who say it went away at the cross, Paul missed a few things here. So you have to, I guess, forgive him. But these realities were about to come. The third term that is used, hupadigma, and it means copy. It's used in conjunction with shadow in Hebrews 8.5, referring to the temple in Hebrews 9.23. Yeah, 9, Fourth, we have the Greek word parabole. I'm having fun watching Sandy. <laughs> Our English word parable, it's found in Hebrews 9.9, 9, where the tabernacle is a symbol of the present time. And in Hebrews 11.19, it's translated type. Finally, there's the, the word anti tupon rendered copy in Hebrews 9.24 and corresponding in, he, in uh, 1 Peter 3.21. The word is used in the New Testament denotes that which corresponds to the type. It's the reality which fulfills the prophetic picture. All right, so we have a type and an anti-type. The type is the picture and the anti-type is the reality. Now, oh, brother, thank you. Sorry, I just got a warning on my computer that my battery was running low. <laughs> Don's fault. Don, I told you to plug that in. <laughs> a type is a real, exalted happening in history which is divinely ordained by the omniscient God to be a prophetic picture of the good things which he purposed to bring to fruition in Christ. Let me give you a few examples that I'm sure that you're familiar with. Numbers 21. And the people spoke against God and Moses. 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. Do you know what just happened to these people? Do you know what they just experienced? And they, you know, I, this is literally my, I mean, I know the corruption of the human heart. I know how bad people can be. But I mean, come on, think of what they just went through in Egypt. Just the Red Sea crossing, all that stuff in there say, why, you know, why have you brought us out here? Well, first of all, if Moses did do that, he could just raise that staff up and say, poof, you're gone. You know, because let's start all over. Now, do you know what happens next in this text? Numbers 21, 6 and 7. It says, And Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against Yahweh and you. Intercede with Yahweh that he may remove the serpents from us. Did you notice what I just did to that text? Anybody catch it? What I do? Okay. Whenever you see the term Lord in all capitals, it is the name of God. It's Yod He Vav He, Y H V H, which is Yahweh. That is our God's name. Now, if you were to go to most Christians and do an experiment, okay? Ask some people you know, what is God's name? And see if they know it. Because I think that most Christians don't even know who Yahweh is. They don't know their God's name. Do you know that almost 7,000 times in the Hebrew Scriptures, we find this name, yod heh vav -Hey, Yahweh. Almost 7,000 times. Do you think God wants us to know His name? 7,000 times. You say, then why don't we? Why did the translators take out Yahweh and put in an indiscriminate title of Lord? Well, you know, the Jews didn't like to use the name of Yahweh. Why? They always built fences around commandments and made it more and more. You know, God said, don't do this on the Sabbath. So they came up with, you know, a lot more rules. And the same thing, God says, don't take my name in vain. So they said, well, let's just don't ever use it. Then we won't have to worry about it. And so they actually just stopped using the name. And in the Second Temple period, the name of Yahweh wasn't used other than on the Day of Atonement. But I think that was a mistake by the Jews. And the translators took that. They said, well, the Jews don't say his name. We don't want to put his name in the Scripture. But I, I don't know. I might be wrong. But I'm just seeing if you put something in there seven thousand times almost I think you want us to know what it is look at Psalm 30 verse 4 praise to Yahweh you his holy one sing praise to Yahweh and give thanks to his holy name how can you give thanks to his holy name if you don't even know what his name is and I think we do have to be careful. We have to reverence that name. We have to honor that name. We have to keep it holy. But I believe He wants us to use it and know it and call to Him. Praise the name of the Lord. How can we praise His name if we don't know it? All right, that was a side note. Back to our story. I just, you know... It's important to me because I just, you know, when you, if you're going to put something in there 7,000 times, I think you want us to know it. Why was God killing the Israelites? What did they do? What was their sin? Complaining. <laughs> so we really are Israel. That's proof right there, okay? <laughs> you don't need any more proof than that. We're still murmuring and complaining. Just like they did. And boy, I'll tell you, you want to do an interesting study. Go through and look at their complaints and look at God's judgment on their complaining. And then the next time you complain about something, think about it. We really are Israel. Numbers goes on. Then Yahweh said to Moses, make a fiery serpent 
set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. And Moses made a bronze serpent, and he set it on a standard. And it came about that if the serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. See, the bronze serpent is a means of salvation for the Israelites. Now, remember that word salvation, deliverance. This is a remarkable type of Christ as a means of our salvation through him. John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So there you see the bronze servant is a type of Christ. Christ is the antitype. Yeshua didn't merely find an apt illustration of his means of saving men by dying on the cross. It was a remarkable, divinely ordained type of salvation from death and punishment by a God-appointed means. Now, what did the Israelites have to do to be delivered, to be saved from the deadly bite of the snake? Join the church? Pray a prayer? Get baptized? Sign a card? Tithe, repent of all wrongdoing, quit smoking, drinking, chewing, and running with those girls that do. What did they have to do? What did they have to do? When he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. What's he trying to tell us with that? They just looked at the serpent. Why? Because they knew salvation was to look in that direction. And so we look to the Lord, Yeshua the Christ, in faith, and we live. And this type is very beautiful, set forth salvation through faith alone, in Christ alone. They just had to look to it. Type and anti-type. So the bronze serpent is the type. Christ is the anti-type. Now let me ask you this. If the church is saved by Christ, and of course we believe they are, but this type is given to Israel. Yet we see the fulfillment of the type in the church. So in typology, we see the unity of the scriptures. William G. Moorhead writes this concerning types. A type is a draft or sketch of some well-defined feature of redemption. And therefore, it must in some distinct way resemble the anti-type. I.e., Aaron as high priest is a rough figure of Christ the great high priest. And the day of atonement in Israel, Leviticus 16, must be a true picture of the atoning work of Christ. A type always prefigures something future. A scriptural type and predictive prophecy are in substance the same, differing only in form. A type always looks to the future. An element of prediction must necessarily be in it. See, a type is an acted out prophecy. And it is truly prophetic as a spoken prophecy and an equal value with spoken prophecy in directing the faith of the Israelites to their coming salvation. For example, in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, we have a spoken prophecy vividly portraying the precarious suffering of Christ. But at the altar in the tabernacle, the same truths were daily predicted both morning and evening as that lamb, that innocent substitute, was taken and put to death and this blood sprinkled before Yahweh. The sacrificial system of Israel was considered by New Testament writers to be a typical and perfect and final sacrifice of Christ. When John the Baptist saw Yeshua, Yeshua coming to him, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that expression, Lamb of God, to which John referred, had such a rich background in the Tanakh, such a rich background for the Israelites. The blood of every innocent victim and the faith of every old covenant offerer now made efficacious through the offering of the perfect and final Lamb of God for the sin of the world. Without His coming, the old covenant sacrifice would have been meaningless and worthless. Let me give you a couple interpretive principles that we need to keep in mind as we study types. It must be recognized that types are grounded in real history. The people, places, events, etc. were deliberately chosen by God to prepare for the coming of the Christian system. Secondly, there is a graduation from type 
to antitype, of the lesser to the greater, from material to the spiritual, from earthly to the heavenly. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So it was written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Here Paul's talking about Adam, who he calls a type. In Romans 5, 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Then speaking of Adam and Christ, in 1 Corinthians, Paul said this, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. Now, let me say a word here. This is one of my problems with covenant eschatology. Okay, they take the first chapters of Genesis and they make them an anti-type. And we don't really have a type because they, take, they make that spiritual and, you know, maybe it's me that's not understanding all this, but, you know, according to types, I have a problem with that whole system. Now, I think there's a lot of, you know, typology in Genesis in the, in the beginning chapters. There's no doubt about that, but I just don't see that. I don't see that as not talking about creation. The natural's first, then the spiritual. So the type is natural, it's earthly, it's material, the anti-type is spiritual, heavenly, and it's the fulfillment of the reality. Now that being said, what I want you to understand concerning our subject of Israel is that national, ethnic Israel was a type. And I think understanding this is crucial. And dispensational misses this very important point, and they try to keep separate the type and the anti-type. The people of Israel themselves were a type. The nation itself, as God's people, was typical of the true people of Yahweh. It was physical Israel. But Paul describes Christian believers as spiritual Israel. National Israel was divinely ordained to resemble spiritual Israel. And the physical seed of Abraham typifies the spiritual seed of Abraham. And some of the promises made to his seed were not fulfilled at all to the physical seed. But as Paul teaches in Romans 4, only to the spiritual children. Physical Israel as a type of spiritual Israel is constantly set forth by Paul in Romans and Galatians. In an understanding of the nation Israel as a type, we won't be surprised to find that Israel's sacrifices, her priesthood, her temple, her land, also had typical significance. And see, dispensationalism puts great emphasis on a rebuilt temple and a priesthood because they failed to see these were types. And when the anti-type comes, you don't care about that anymore. You don't care about the picture, you don't care about the shadows when you have the reality. When I was at sea, I had pictures of my wife and my kids all over the place. I'd get in my bunk at night, I had them taped to the top of the bunk, you have this much room in your face in the top rack ahead of you, and, and I'd lay there and look at their pictures, you know, because that's all I had was a picture. When I got off that ship and got home, I didn't have those pictures taped around my bed anymore. I had the reality there with me. And you know, people, when we have the reality, when we have the anti-type, we don't need to look for and hang on to the types. Physical Israel was a type, and so was the tabernacle. In Hebrews 8, 2, it says, A minister in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Speaking of Christ ministering in the true tabernacle, then speaking of the earthly tabernacle, he says, who serve a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. See, the tabernacle was a type. What's the anti-type? Yeshua is the anti-type. Now, I've talked to people that, you know, I know some guys that are really involved in trying to find the Ark of the Covenant. You know, they just think it'd be, you know, just a blessed testimony, you know, and people would wake up and, well, first of all, I'm a presuppositionalist, so I don't think that's going to make a whole lot of difference in anybody's faith, you know, finding that thing. Secondly, Jeremiah 3.16 says it's never going to come to mind. The things will be forgotten. It doesn't matter anymore. You know, so I don't really think they'll ever find that. But see, here's the problem with me again. That was a type. That mercy seat was a type. What's the anti-type? 
Christ. He's the fulfillment. He's our mercy. See, we don't need that anymore. So I don't think it'd be that significant. I think it'd be cool to see it. But it's not going to change my faith. And I don't think it changed anybody else's either. Yeshua is the anti-type. John 2.19, Yeshua answered and said to them, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Because Yeshua replaces the temple. He's the anti-type of the temple. The temple resembled, represented the presence of God among the children of Israel in the early days. So Christ is described in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word dwelt here. Skenao, it means a tent. Yeshua came and he pitched his tent. He tabernacled among us. Notice what Peter says to the Jewish leaders. Let it be known to all you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yeshua, the Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Now notice what Peter says of Christ. He is the stone which was rejected by you. He adds that. <laughs> so Peter's adding his scripture. Yeah, he's allowed to do that, okay? He's an apostle, and he is writing scripture. And so he's quoting here from Psalm 118 that says, the stone was rejected by the builders. And he says, oh, by the way, you are the ones, by you the builders, became the very cornerstone. Yeshua is the cornerstone upon which the spiritual house of Yahweh is built. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that we have been given among men by which we must be saved. See, if you don't build on the cornerstone, which is Yeshua, you don't have salvation. By the way, what's the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua. Whose Savior was Yeshua? Acts 13, 23. From the offspring of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Yeshua. Yeshua is Israel's Savior. So if the church and Israel are different, who's our Savior? Israel's Savior is our Savior because we are Israel. Well, how did Israel move from a type to an anti-type? How did they do that? They underwent a second exodus. At the transfiguration, Luke wrote, who appeared in glory, or speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The word departure here is the Greek word exodus. See, there was another exodus that Yeshua was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. This was another 40-year journey not a physical one, but a spiritual one. When did the second exodus begin? Well, to answer that, you need to know when the first exodus began. So what began the first exodus? It was Passover. You remember the first Passover was observed when Israel was about to be delivered from slavery in Egypt. Exodus 12, 3 says, Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. And who was the anti-type of the lamb? Well, it's the Lord Yeshua, the Christ. Passover was a type, it was a picture of something much greater. It pictured a redemption of God's elect through the sacrifice of the sinless Son of God. And the typical significance of Passover is very, very clear in New Testament writings. Probably there's no Mosaic institution that's a more perfect type than this. The first Passover was celebrated by the children of Israel on the 14th of Nisan. That began Israel's exodus out of Egypt. Then almost 2,000 years later, Yeshua, the Christ, was crucified on the 14th of Nisan, beginning that second exodus, another 40-year period. So the first exodus, the type and the anti-type, both began on Passover. Israel's journey from Egypt to Canaan, the Exodus, was a type. Now, who led Exodus out of Israel? I mean, out of, who led Israel out of Egypt? Moses, right? 
Moses is a type of Yeshua. Yeshua is the anti-type. Moses was the first savior of Israel, whom God had empowered to redeem Israel. This was prefiguring the true redeemer, who by his perfect sacrifice redeemed Israel from death. In 2 Corinthians 3, Moses stands in relation to the first covenant as Christ does to the second. One is inferior and preparatory, the other is spiritual and final. In these ways, then, the life of Moses points beyond itself to the life and work of Christ. Now, and it's just so fascinating to compare these two. Like Moses, Yeshua will grow up in Egypt. Like the story of Moses, Herod slaughters the male children. Like Moses exiled to Midian, Yeshua's exile to Egypt will end with the death of Herod Pharaoh. And then we have a new exodus foretold. He says, out of Egypt I have called my son. And you would never get that right if you didn't have the New Testament to interpret that. Okay? Yeshua goes up on a mountain like Moses, and he gives the new Torah, Sermon on the Mount. And the transfiguration is, is just pregnant with Exodus symbolism. And just as Moses went up into the mountain with three companions, so Yeshua does the same thing. Moses' face shone with the glory of God, and the face of Yeshua shone like the sun. And Matthew tells us Moses and Elijah appear, and the voice from the cloud says, This is my beloved son, listen to him. It's most likely echoing the words of Deuteronomy 18.15. Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses says, from among you. From your countrymen, you shall listen to him. See, from the mount, the Lord descends, as Moses did, to find confusion on the plain. And in Mark 9, 19, he says, And he answered them and said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And Matthew and Luke add the word perverse here, which shows that they saw a parallel between the generation of our Lord's day and the generation of the first exodus. In the book of Acts, Stephen begins his sermon with a review of Israel's history. In this, the Exodus receives the major part of his attention. And there's a clear parallel between Moses the Redeemer, rejected by his people who worshipped idols, and Yeshua the Redeemer, rejected by his people who used the Jewish cultists in an adulterous way. So the nation of Israel was a type, and their leader, Moses, was a type. What was the first Mosaic institution given you're right Mark the Sabbath and you know there's not one text in the Bible that adjoins enjoins the observance of the Sabbath upon any man before the Exodus nor since Pentecost the first recorded observance was at the time of giving of the manna in Exodus 16 23 and its purpose was for a memorial a sign according to Exodus 31, 17, of their deliverance from Egypt. And they were, they were a special people of God. And it was observed in commemoration of the beginning of their nation. It was a weekly reminder of their peculiar relationship with Yahweh. It was observed by a complete cessation from work. The law was very strict in its requirement of the Sabbath observance. No fire was to be kindled. No cooking done. And like I said, the Jews always built fences around commandments. We can't do that. We can't work on the Sabbath, so let's make sure we understand workers. And they started adding and adding and adding all kinds of things. You know, you can't, you can't spit in the soft ground because your spittle will make a little ditch and you'll be plowing on the Sabbath. You can't push a chair as you stand up and makes furrows. we, we got to stone you because you're working on the Sabbath. But then they build fences and then they build ways to get around fences. Because you're only allowed to travel so much on the Sabbath. So they say, okay, as long as you're in your house, that doesn't count. And then they started tying ropes to themselves and attaching them to the house, because as long as you're attached to the house, that's still counted as being part of the house, so that travel doesn't count either. I mean, you know, it's just, it's crazy. It's sad. And here's the, and the Sabbath became an incredible burden that was crushing them. And the sad thing was it was given as a blessing. In a culture where labor was so hard, Here's a day, guess what? You just rest. You just relax. You spend time you know, enjoying food that you'd prepared the day ahead of time. You spend time with your family. You spend time with your God. You just, it's a rest. And it's sad that the Sabbath 
is a picture. So Sabbath is a type. Christ is the anti-type. But boy, the type gets all mixed up when you make the Sabbath a huge burden. We've already seen in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, the Sabbath was a type or shadow. So what's the anti-type? Well, the anti-type's Yeshua. The main idea of the Sabbath was rest. And that physical rest, therefore, must have been typical of some higher rest to be found by the Christian. And the strict observance of the Sabbath, which God required of the Jews, like the requirement of the strict observance of the divine pattern for the tabernacle, was because it was to typify a perfect spirit rest of the Christian. Now, centuries before Moses, the patriarch Jacob predicted Christ's coming under the name Shiloh, which means rest giver. Yeshua himself is the rest giver. And the rest that he gives is the burden and the bondage from sin. And he is our Sabbath rest. And that this is the true Sabbath keeping is argued by the inspired writer of Hebrews, whoever it was. In chapter 4, he makes this very clear. That Yeshua is our Sabbath rest. Now the Sabbath, like the other ceremonial requirements of the law of Moses, has been abolished, but the blessed spirit rested prefigured remains for the people of God. The writer of Hebrews says that Joshua, who led the Israelites into Canaan, failed to give them the promised rest, and he spiritualizes that the promised rest, and he locates it not in literal Canaan, but in Christ, who is a type of Canaan. It's positive proof that God attached typical meaning to that journey of the Israelites. Now, what event ended the first Exodus period? Something got ruined, destroyed, right? Jericho stood at the entrance of the Promised Land. It was a fortified city that represented a serious challenge to Israel's claim to the land. Its fall telegraphed a message to all the world that Yahweh was the Lord of his people. What marked the end of the second exodus? Thank you. I knew someone would get that one right. Okay. <laughs> the destruction of Jerusalem. Listen, Joshua is from the Hebrew Yehoshua. And in Joshua sometimes appear in the shortened form is Yeshua. Old covenant Judaism was a major problem for those early believers. And nothing represents the old system better than the temple. And here was where the presence of God dwelt. His presence assured them they were his people. But 40 years after the cross in AD 70, believers fled the city of Jerusalem as the walls fell and the city was destroyed and burned. And similar to the collapse of the walls of Jericho, the fall of Jerusalem was symbolized by the entrance of the redeemed remnant into Christ's everlasting kingdom. The believers were vindicated and revealed as the sons of God while judgment fell on that Jewish system which rejected their God as king. And believers now reside in the new Jerusalem, which is the new covenant. Look at Galatians 4, 24. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants. Now, I want you, he makes it real clear what he's talking about here. He's talking about two covenants. This is a great passage to take people to. Because it's really hard to get around this passage. All right, talking about two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai. Now, what covenant you think that was? Bearing children who are to be slaves. Paul is talking about two covenants, the old and the new. He says, now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. It's interesting here he locates where Sinai is. Not on the Sinai Peninsula, people. It's not there. That's a tradition that was made up by Constantine's mother. She said, where's Mount Sinai? She goes, oh, she had some vision. She says, here it is. Oh, that's a good mountain. And they, they built a little thing underneath it, and they said, this is Mount Sinai. It's not there. Paul says, it's in Arabia. And corresponding to the present Jerusalem. Not present now, present then. Mount Sinai corresponded to Jerusalem that was there. He says, for she is slave in slavery with her children. The present Jerusalem of Paul's day represented the old covenant and the slavery that was there. He says, but the Jerusalem above is free. 
What exactly is this Jerusalem above who is free, who is our mother? We've got to keep in mind that the comparison here is between two covenants. Earthly Jerusalem represents the old covenant. So heavenly Jerusalem represents what? The new covenant. So to be in the heavenly Jerusalem is to be in the new covenant. The people are still looking. I can't wait for that thing to come down out of the sky. By the way, Mark, who's an engineer, has developed a model of the new Jerusalem and compared it to the earth. And you've got to see that picture he shows you. If, it was, if the size is what the Bible says, it's going to knock us, you know, clean out of, I mean, this thing is like a third size of the earth, you know, coming down and setting on the earth, and very interesting. The events of Jericho offered a graphic image and an actual prophecy of the events at the close of the Jewish age. Forty years after Pentecost, when there were seven angels with seven trumpets of doom and judgment, according to Revelation 8, 2, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. And at that time, the great and powerful city of Babylon, which was Jerusalem, suddenly fell. Standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And as Joshua, or Yehoshua, the destruction of the city came at the sound of a trumpet just like it did the first time. So at the end of the Jewish age, the destruction of Jerusalem comes as Yeshua sounds the trumpet. Now this Exodus typology is seen throughout the New Testament. We see it very clearly in the book of Acts. Speaking of Moses, Stephen says this, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness. And the word for congregation here is ecclesia. It's the word taken over and used by the church. Acts 20, 28, be on guard for yourselves and the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church, the ecclesia of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This was the flock that he had purchased. They were redeemed of the Lord. They were Israel. Now notice what Paul teaches in Romans 9, and this is a, this is a monumental text. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Romans 9, 10, 11 is a theodicy. It's a defense of God. Because, you know, the, here's the argument. Well, you're attributing to the church all these promises that were made to Israel. Then, you know, God's failed Israel. It's not as though the word of God failed, he said. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So Israel's not Israel. That's right, you got it. We have here physical Israel, those who descended from Jacob. And then we have true Israel. So physical Israel, true Israel. And Paul is saying that God's promises haven't failed because God never promised unconditionally to each offspring of Abraham covenantal blessings. God never intended for the nation Israel, all of them to be redeemed. Within national Israel was true Israel or spiritual Israel. There was always the remnant. So one could be an Israelite without truly being an Israelite. The promises were a true Israel, not national Israel. So who is Israel? Is it the church? Well, yeah. But what is the church? It's the body of Christ, right? And what I want you to understand, what I want you to see, what I think is so important, is that Yeshua is true Israel. He is the Israel of God. He is the faithful Israelite who honored God and kept God's word. And it is in him, in him alone, that the promises of God are fulfilled. We could say, they are not all in Christ who are physically descendants of Jacob. You can interpret that text that way. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. Yeshua is the antitype of the Mosaic institution. He fulfills the law, every bit of it. And guess what? I'm in him and I fulfill every bit of it either. Also, either, also, yeah. Now notice what Peter says to the church. Don mentioned this. The first century believers. 1 Peter 2.10. He quotes Hosea. He says, for you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. 
You had not received mercy, but now have received mercy. This is a promise that God made to Israel in Hosea 1 that you would be called out of the nations and brought back to Messiah. And Peter writing to the Gentiles who have become Christians and he calls them a chosen race. He says you were once not a people, now you are the people of God. This is a promise that God made to the house of Israel through Hosea which is fulfilled in the church because the church is Israel. So Israel and the church are not separate peoples. National Israel was a type, and the church, the true Israel, is the anti-type. And as we study the New Testament, we see that all the promises that God made to his covenant people are fulfilled in the church, the true Israel, which is those and only those who are in Christ. And so I think the important thing that we see here is Christ is Israel. Yeshua is the fulfillment. He is Israel, and being in Him is how we are the true Israel of God, and all the promises are fulfilled in Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for the privilege just to be again with Your family, to have the opportunity to look at Your Word. Father, we have so much today in the area of understanding the scriptures. So many insights. So many things that bring, open up the word of God that we may see things more clearly. So many study aids. Lord, I pray that you would give each and every one of us the heart of Bereans. That our desire would be to know the truth. And we would not believe the things that we hear. We would not accept them. We would not reject them. We would take them and contemplate them. We would take them back to your word. And study and see if these things are so. Give us the heart of students, Lord, who study not just for knowledge, not just for argument's sake, that study that they may know and honor their God. Thank you, Lord, for your constant grace. We again pray for Glenn and Betty Sue and their grandchild, Lord, Seth, that you would intervene in this situation for your glory. You would protect, you would care for them. Lord, I thank you for all these people here and the sacrifice they've made to be here. And Lord, I pray that as they travel back home in the next couple of days, that you would bless, that we would take this message, Lord, to the world. We would share it with people we know. That this word would spread. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.